Without getting bogged down on the math, which I admit can be quite daunting, I'd like to explain our current idea of how atoms are structured. This is a quantum mechanical model. So the last model of the atom that you explored was Bohr's atom, in which negative electrons orbited around the massive positive nucleus in circular orbits just like planets orbit around the Sun. This model was a spectacular success. It incredibly well predicted what the emission spectra of hydrogen gas looked like. So this is when they took hydrogen gas, put it in a glass tube, put a large electric current through it, it would emit light, and Bohr's atom predicted exactly what all the wavelengths of light would be. It was spectacular. It was also a spectacular success with other elements as long as the atoms had only one electron in them. So if you had the helium plus one ion or the lithium plus two ion, Bohr's model predicted their spectra exactly. However, any other kind of atom, anything that had more than one electron, it did not work at all. So Bohr's model, although it was a tremendous step forward, was not truly explaining what was going on inside atoms. So physics was at an impasse for a while until Louis de Broglie, in a 14-page PhD thesis, came up with a truly astonishing and revolutionary idea that perhaps electrons acted as waves. That's an amazing idea. Electrons, we knew, were negatively charged particles. We detected them when they struck a screen, when they hit a detector, they were particles. Maybe, de Borel said, they're waves. This wasn't as crazy as it sounded, because photons, which had long been established to be waves, were starting to act like particles as well. When they were detected, they'd show up as a dot. If the photon, light, which we had long thought were waves, might act like particles, perhaps it wasn't that unreasonable to think that electrons, which we long thought were particles, might act like waves. It was known by this time partly from the work of Einstein, that photons, particles of light, actually have momentum. Hmm, that's a very particle-like property, and that's maybe something you didn't realize about light. And the momentum of light is related to the wavelength of light in this fashion. Momentum, P, is equal to H, that's Planck's constant, which had been used in the context of light before, divided by the wavelength. The longer the wavelength, the lower the momentum, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the momentum. This wasn't too surprising because Einstein and other workers had also previously seen that the energy of light increases as the wavelength goes down. So it also makes sense the momentum would increase as the wavelength goes down. But then, well, if electrons are waves, we know all sorts of things that waves do. And perhaps electrons do these things too. One of the things that waves do is form standing waves of certain frequencies and certain wavelengths when they're confined to a, a small area, such as a rope that's fixed between two points, or a membrane that's vibrating, or water in a tub. There are specific wavelengths and specific frequencies at which you can set up sustained motion. These are known as standing waves. These standing waves have specific frequencies, specific shapes, specific energies. Now this is sounding an awful lot like what these atoms are doing. Atoms are emitting light at very specific wavelengths and frequencies. So maybe this is because the electrons inside the atoms had these, were these standing waves and changing from one standing wave to another required a certain very specific amount of energy. And energies in between were not allowed. This proposed wave nature of electrons could very well explain the quantum nature of the energy transitions ex exhibited by these atoms. That's an amazing idea. Really cool, I think. Well, de Broglie reasoned, if for light momentum is equal to h over lambda, perhaps that's true for an electron as well. If momentum is h over wavelength, then wavelength is going to be h over momentum. Here we're showing one possibility for how this can work, thinking of an electron as a wave superimposed on a circular orbit around the nucleus. 
this turns out to not be exactly what goes on. What goes on is actually much more interesting and much cooler. This is the first idea. Let's review a little bit about what we've seen about standing waves. When a wave is confined to some space between, the clamp, between clamps in a tub of water, then the waves interfere. They combine with their reflections. In one and two dimensions, it's easy to see how this happens when you have waves in a spring or in a slinky or on the surface of water or in a membrane. So I'll give some examples of two-dimensional waves. These are waves that can be formed in a circular membrane. The context for waves like this is, well, this is the kind of wave that will form in a drum head. With one-dimensional waves, the nodes are points along a line. With two-dimensional waves, nodes are lines or curves in the surface. Here's some examples. Here's the lowest vibration of a circular membrane. It's just vibrating up and down, up and down in the middle. Now here is a higher frequency oscillation. This one has a node that's a diameter. It cuts right across the middle, bisects this circle. When the membrane on one side of this node is going up, the part of the membrane on the other side is going down. So there's a reversal across the node. Another type of node, this is a circular node. This node is at a fixed radius from the center. So you can see that there's a circle that holds still, essentially, and while the membrane outside the circle is going up, the membrane inside the circle is going down. There's a reversal across the node. Standing waves that have more nodes have higher frequency. In the context of electrons or light, that would mean a higher energy and a higher momentum as well. So to recap, waves with short wavelengths have high frequency and high energy. Only short waves can fit in small spaces. So the more you try to confine a wave, the higher the energy of that wave has to be. This proposed wave nature of electrons answered a confusing riddle about electrons. Why, if they're negatively charged, don't they just stick close to the positively charged nucleus of atoms? Because negative and positive electric charges attract, shouldn't they be at their lowest energy when they're right next to each other? Well, it turns out that electrons don't collapse onto the nucleus because the smaller volume that you try to confine a wave to, the higher frequency it must be. The higher its energy, the higher its momentum. It has to be moving faster. It has to have more kinetic energy. It has to have more momentum. It's not going to then be able to stay next to the nucleus. It's going to be moving all around. It's going to be out. So a smaller radius, a more confined space, sticking an electron next to a nucleus is going to require a larger energy than letting it spread out into a larger space. So the lowest energy possible state, the ground state of an electron, is going to be one that optimizes both the electric interaction and the wavelength. So the electric interaction wants to make the electron close to the nucleus. The wave nature makes it want to have a larger area to move around in. Just as an aside, then you might ask the same question. Well, if an electron can't be confined to a nucleus, how can a proton and a neutron? The answer to this is their mass. Protons and neutrons are much more massive than electrons. Momentum is Planck's constant divided by wavelength. So wavelength is Planck's constant divided by momentum. If you have two objects, one light, one heavy, say an electron and a proton, and they have the same wavelength, that means they have the same momentum. So in this case, we're showing the light object must have a small mass and a large velocity. The heavy object, to have the same momentum, has a large mass and a small velocity. However, this more massive object with a lower velocity has a substantially lower kinetic energy because while momentum is directly proportional to both mass and velocity, kinetic energy is directly proportional to mass, but directly proportional to the square of velocity. Velocity matters more for kinetic energy than it does for momentum. With the same momentum 
the more massive object has a substantially lower kinetic energy. The confined massive particle, the proton, the neutron, can be at a low energy in a small volume, whereas the light electron cannot. This is why the nuclei can be small and compact and massive, and the electrons have to spread out in space around the nucleus. That's why electrons take up most of the space in the atom, and the nuclei take up almost none of it.